The Deutsche Borst is Britain's foremost prize for contemporary photography. It takes place every year here at the Photographer's Gallery behind me. As always, there are four finalists in contention for the prize. This year, the four artists are Mishka Henner, Christina de Medel, Chris Killip, and Broomberg and Channerin. So I'm here with Mishka Henner to talk about his series, No Man's Land. A lot of my work is, looks at, tries to look at the unintended consequences of the technology and the networks and the uh, ubiquity of cameras that there are. And it seemed to me that the, uh, the Street View project was a really interesting one of uh, you know, having cameras attached to cars that are then roaming the world. And so the more I worked on it, the more I sort of discovered these online communities of men that use it to share information on where they can find street sex workers around the world. And that to me seemed um, you know, pretty dark and sinister, but absolutely necessary to, to do something with. Let's go over and talk about these two and start with this one first. People think that I've blurred the faces, uh, but I, I mean, I haven't. I've done very little to the imagery. And do the Google cameras usually blur faces out? Yeah, I mean, if you see posters on the, wall, on the on streets that have uh, faces on them, they'll, for the most part, be blurred. Yeah. That's, again, that's got loads of resonances, hasn't it? Yeah. It could almost be a fashion shoot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, street, the, the, the relationship between street furniture and the clothing, you know, I just think is fascinating. You know, you, you start... The accidental relationship, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, we know, we, we know so little. We don't know much about anything that's going on in that scene, but we fill the gaps, which is how I think photography works. Again, this is another one that looks sort of so sort of almost pastoral. A kind of hum humanistic documentarian might try in some way to engage with the women and try to evoke the kind of um, the substance of that relationship. But actually, I think that I mean, when I when I started working on this, it felt it felt far more right as a process. In that, you know, it felt almost more honest to try to tackle a subject like this in this kind of remote, detached way, which I think is the experience that most people have to it. And, and, and yet, you know... Uh, it's also what it's doing. It's very detached. Yeah, but it forces you to look. Yeah. You know, it forces you to look at something that you would otherwise just drive by. This is Christina de Medel, another of the shortlisted artists in this year's Deutsche Börse Photography Prize. And um, she's in for her project, The Afronauts, which she's now going to tell us about. <laughs> it's a story about the Zambian space program um, that happened, really. In 1964, right after gaining independence from the UK, they, like some a group of people, started uh, training to go to the moon and then to Mars with a self-made catapult system. And, well, Almost too good to be true. I didn't believe it. And is it true? Is it not true? So I really wanted to not only tell the story, which I think is amazing, but also try to to force the audience to have the same reaction as I had. So I decided to play with fact and fiction. I could have just uh, tried to find images that of the real uh, space program, or just go into something more classical. Uh, stating that they went or they didn't go. But I really wanted to play with the mystery and the enigma of uh, all this magic of Africa and space put together and how it's so hard for you to understand and assume that this is something real. So, so you, you and your grandmother made the actual costume, the space, the space yeah. costume, right? Mm. This is a public light, uh, I don't know how you call a street it. Light. A street light, yeah. It's a street light. Like it was the, the main challenge of, like the most difficult part of all the production was actually making the hole bigger. So I could use it as a helmet. And it took me two days of production, uh, which was it's the, more, the longest time investment I've done in the production. And where did you series. find this guy? Uh, I, I worked a lot and I've been very active for a long time uh, and have a big network and social networks. So I just, people already knew I was going to do that, my close friends, and I just uh, posted on Facebook that I needed uh, African models for photo shooting in Alicante. So he's a friend of a friend of a friend. He's a computer engineer, actually, and a handball player, a professional handball player. And I think he, he just, it was a very good starting point because yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was the perfect character and he had the, exactly the correct 
the pose and attitude I needed for the rest of the series. So it was kind of a statement to start with him because it gave me the chance to ask for the same thing in the rest of the shootings. And this one has always intrigued me because <laughs> this, this is ground control. <laughs> yes, yes, I needed this image of, uh, well, there's rocket, there's uh, moon landing, there's uh, like all this mystery and enigma, but I needed one, one image that was really a cliche of the space race, that is Houston headquarters of NASA, and I needed an African version of that, so I used my context and maybe previous experiences I had as a photojournalist in Spain, and I had gained access in a very strange way to an abandoned factory near Spain, near, near Alicante. And it's actually, uh, I was not given permission to get in, but the f uh, relative uh, was working there, they gave me the keys, and I had two hours to, to shoot that before the, the owner of the factory came back. So I, it was really a, a, I think that working as a photojournalist was a good training for me <laughs> to yeah. do these things because I'm really fast producing. I mean, the only thing that is real is the story. Yeah and yeah. maybe a couple of documents, but the rest is all documenting my imagination in a way. And I see myself, my imagination, imagination as a result of a cliche of post-colonialism, so I am aware that this vision of, of Africans is uh, in a way contaminated, as is the result of having consumed uh, what is Africa for everybody and what is space for everybody with, without, with very little critical uh, approach to it. I mean, you, have you had any criticism for? Actually, I have been invited to uh, festivals in Africa. I have shown my work in South Africa too, and then uh, the Nigerian space program was even in contact with me. So all, I get a lot of feed good feedback from Africans telling me, "Thank you, this is an amazing story." And most of the bad reaction or violent reaction to the series come from white people. Okay. We're just not used to it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we feel guilty. So now we come to Chris Killip's exhibition. Uh, Chris can't actually be with us today as he's not in London, um, but this show spans uh, from 1970 to 1990 and it's called What Happened? Great Britain. Chris is one of the great documentary photographers of our time. His work chronicles the decline of the industrial regions of the northeast of Britain. I live in America and I vote Democrat. Um, if I lived in England, I would vote Labour. So I have my own political agenda, but I'm not trying to push a political agenda. I mean, I'm trying to show you what's, what's happening, what's happened. I'm very conscious of myself as, as a photograph, as a, of an historian of sorts. And when I was photographing in Newcastle, I knew this was going to change. I had no idea that it was going to change as quickly as it did. He's an incredible uh, documentary of um, moments like this, which are qu quite wistful and yet hard hitting. Um, this is a very famous photograph of the two guys waiting around and you can see that he captures the moment in that real cardio brace on way but if you look closely you see the tattoo around the guy's neck the whole hardship of the place this one is a guy being taken to sea for the first time after his father had drowned in a, in a fishing boat so it's a very very poignant photograph um, a portrait as well as a piece of documentary this is the Queen's Silver Jubilee celebrations on Tyneside, North Shields. Um, I just love this photograph because it's so strange. It could almost be a Diana, Diane Arbus photograph when you look at this woman's extraordinary face, powdered face and the black eyes peering at you. And again, it shows Killip's wonderful sort of capturing of a moment in time. So we're in the Photographer's Gallery still with Broomberg and Channerin. Um, and we're here to talk about War Primer 2, uh, which is in contention for this year's Deutsche Börse Prize. I'm going to start by asking you guys just very simply to talk about the gestation of the idea, where it came from. How the project starts with a book, an incredible book by Bertolt Brecht, which he published in 1955. And Adam and I came across this book a few years ago, and we were really struck by how contemporary it was. Um, and the more we investigated, we discovered Brecht's extraordinary relationship with photographic images. We hadn't understood that he had done a lot of work in relationship to images of conflict. So what he had done, most, mostly in the time when he was in exile, so he was outside of his community of theatre, and, and, and um, every day he would cut one image out of the newspaper, paste it down into his workbook, and he famously was quite suspicious of images in the press, and he, call, he called them hieroglyphics. And he would write a four-line poem um, that he would 
put underneath the image that sometimes would decode the, the hieroglyphics, sometimes complicate it, but um, all the time it would kind of render, you know, push a re-reading of that image. So the whole thing was about his suspicion of official information? Yeah, and his remit was the Second World War. And as we know, you know, aerial bombings, there was a whole lot of kind of new photography that you were seeing. You had never seen the world from above at that time. So he was kind of contemplating all these new strategies in photography, what that meant, what they did tell you about war and what they didn't tell you about war. And what we did was we thought, let's use this as a model for looking at the way images of war have changed or the production of images of war has changed since Brecht's time. I think what we're very interested in is the idea of a photograph as a piece of currency. That you, you take a photograph and it suddenly has a value and it suddenly slots into a whole economic system of distribution. And we should also make clear that this is really a project about the book as the art object. I mean, even though it's now in a gallery. I wouldn't call it so much an art object because the, uh, the reason we limited to 100 books is that it was so labour intensive. This took us three months with a kind of army of volunteers and people helping us, because it's literally hand silk screened into the original book. Each picture is produced and pasted in there. Well, Brecht's original book began with the, the Second World War, and our book begins with the War on Terror. But maybe it's quite interesting to read Brecht's poem here and look at that image and see how it resonated in the 50s with an image from the Second World War and see how it kind of prescient it is with the War on Terror. A cloud of smoke told us that they were here, they were the sons of fire, not of the light. They came from where? They came out of the darkness. Where did they go? Into eternal night. That was, the, that was Brecht's original, which is, uh, that's not the Twin Towers, that was yeah. his original. And for him, that was a new mode of, of image production, so which was the photograph, aerial yeah, photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on. You can choose, you guys, whatever. Well, why, don't we, why don't we have a look at this one? Yeah. Okay. Here, Brecht has taken a photograph of Hitler um, a rating. In full flow. In full flow. And he says, like one who dreams the road ahead is steep, I know the way fate has prescribed for us, that narrow way towards a precipice. Just follow, I can find it in my sleep. That's great. But the image on top that we've pasted over is uh, of Don Donald Rumsfeld that comes from a website called www.unicyclist.org. And I think we're less interested in a kind of glib comparison between Rumsfeld and Hitler and more into the idea of the photo opportunity and how that's an endured um, genre almost, you know, how politicians kind of think in that very cynical mode. A lot of people have referred to 9-11 as an image wound that was sustained by America, right? And the subsequent two wars, one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq was they describe as a genocidal search for iconic images that would, that would fight against that image wound. And I think if you look at Bush you know, declaring victory on the boat, if you look at images like this or of Saddam Hussein's execution, which they all released, they were in desperate search for these iconic images, but they got it wrong time and time again. And I think Obama realized that mistake, said we're gonna pull back, we're gonna be more sophisticated, we're gonna show uh, you know, a group of people in very concerned, deliberating something very serious, and that was their image that they put out. Just to read Brecht's poem, which kind of undermines that and renders a new reading of that. And may he die like a dog, that's my last wish. That he was their arch enemy, believe me, I speak truth. And I'm free to speak where I am now. Only the law and the lone cricket know. 